because globally we deforest around 10 million hectares of forest every year. And that's an area the size of Portugal, the entire country of Portugal every decade. Macbeth shall never vanquished be until great Burnham Wood to high Dunsinane Hill shall come against him. Well, folks, welcome to another Climate Emergency Forum discussion. Today's topic, forests in crisis. And I started this discussion with Shakespeare talking about the Burnham Wood actually marching to Dunsinane. But now we have quite a twist because instead of the woods marching, the woods are actually in retreat. And the reason the woods are in retreat is because of us, man, that is human beings. We are making them be further and further and further in retreat because of our inevitable, it seems, encroachment upon them. And it's, uh, it's a really, really sad story for all of us, for all living beings, because globally we deforest around 10 million hectares of forest every year. And that's an area the size of Portugal, the entire country of Portugal every decade. So around half of this deforestation, it is offset by regrowing forests, but I wanna I want to contrast this with new growth forests are not the same as old growth forests. We need to have old growth forests because they're the older, the bigger trees. They can draw down more carbon from the atmosphere. Their roots are much deeper into the ground and into the earth. And of primary importance of this time of global warming and climate change, they're less apt to burn the way the, um, the new growth trees are. Why is that? Because the new growth trees are a little spindly in comparison to the big robust trees. And when you wanna make a blazing fire, anyone who sat at a, at a fire pit when they're camping or in front of a fireplace, we all know what to do. We put in more kindling. And what is kindling but small sticks of wood that catch fire and burn easily. So this deforestation and the whole notion of, well, we can fix it all by planting new trees. Well, it's a good thought, but it's not the whole picture. And it's something that we really, really need to disabuse people of because so many people do have this idea of, well, you know, take away the old and replace it with the new. That may work for our suburbs, but it does not work for our forests. It does not work for our forests. After the last COP in 2019 in Madrid, I traveled for a few months around Europe. And one of the things that I found particularly notable, and, and I traveled around Europe primarily through the Flix bus. Uh, so I got to actually see the country. And being from the United States, I was really surprised because I didn't see forests. I saw denuded land everywhere where, I, where forests used to be. And I, I do have this one picture that I'd like to share with you. I, I call it a tree grows in Europe because you see any trees that I saw were bounded in like these tree pits surrounded by cement. That's not a forest, that's far from it. So what's happening in Brazil and other places like the Ecuadorian and Peruvian Amazon with a deforestation is exactly what happened hundreds of years ago in Europe, the colonizing of the land. Depopulation of native arboreal species as well as the living species that were interdependent upon them. And Bolsonaro's response is, we want our Europe, we want our time. 
we want to grow economically. It's a hard argument in many ways to fight against. Um, Peter, what would you say to something like that? In some ways, it's perhaps valid. Thanks, Regina. That's a very good and pertinent point, and it applies to China as well, and it applies to India as well. Um, and as you say, Brazil, they're trying to, uh, as they put it, catch up with the um, advanced, supposedly advanced um, Western North American civilization, but the planet can't keep up with that. And the result is that the planet is in a state of collapse, and that collapse is accelerating. I'd like to start with um, uh, a very important quote from the IPCC from their last assessment, their fifth assessment in 2014. They put together all of the research around the world on the state of the forests. And they uh, made an impressive map out of that. And a quote um, from, the, um, from their assessment was, in all vegetated continents, tree tree mortality is increasing due to temperature stress and drought and forest dieback is also increasing on all vegetated continents. So while it's uh, certainly correct that as you say we're planting trees and it's also correct that as predicted by the scientists the forests as a whole are greening so when we look at a NASA map just of the surface, we see, we, we, it looks like there's more forests and they're greening because of the fertilization effect of carbon dioxide. But it has also been long predicted back in uh, 2001 by the IPCC that though the forests would green up under global warming and carbon dioxide, they would inevitably at the same time be damaged and degraded. So we have a, uh, in a sense, we have this under, um, um, undergoing process and this process is accelerating. Now, we are well aware of fire. So fire is increasing in both of the world's two great forests. The Amazon, of course, is well known, but the other great forest is called the Boreal Forest and it's a circumpolar forest. It goes right around the earth, just south of the um, Arctic. And that holds more carbon even than the Amazon. The uh, deforestation of the Amazon over the past few years has uh, increased remarkably. And um, although the deforestation was higher in the 70s, um, uh, we have not Done, we have not achieved really any control over the deforestation of the Amazon whatsoever, no, no matter who is actually in charge. And uh, we're losing uh, uh, tropical forests at the rate of one football, one football pitch per minute. It's actually double that because we're degrading the forests as well as removing the trees and a degraded forest does, doesn't work as a forest. Um, I'm very glad that Regina pointed out the uh, biodiversity and the difference between uh, old growth and new growth. So the old growth forests that are in the Amazon and the old growth forests that are in Canada where, where I live and, and in Russia and in China still, we're destroying those old growth forests worldwide at a rapid, rapid rate. The old growth forests hold most of the carbon they are warehouses of carbon. And if they're left alone, they will continue for many, many, many decades to hold that carbon intact. They're also, of course, the home for the majority of the world's species and the greatest biodiversity. The latest research project, uh, the latest research, which was just out just last week, was on the boreal forest. The uh, researchers, and this is a familiar story, the researchers have looked more closely at the satellite data and they find that the boreal forest, the amount of carbon that it's sinking is only about half what they had previously projected. And that is due to fire and disturbance in the boreal, in this massive, massive forest. 
The, uh, the most important research was in 2017. That was from a team led by Bacini in which they found that the satellite data when they looked at that closely for all the tropical forests showed that the forests were a net carbon sink rather than a source. Those forests were losing more carbon than they were sinking. So we're in a dire emergency for our forests and a dire emergency for life within those forests and on land in general. Thank you, Peter. The destruction of the forests by fire is truly frightening. Um, and I'm wondering if either you or Paul can answer what is the greatest driver of deforestation in, um, in the Amazon? One of the uh, things that's happening in the Amazon um, is there are certain years when, when there's uh, been um, tremendous drought so if there's drought on the eastern side of the Amazon, then the important thing to know is that the water is recycled. So the uh, water that is absorbed by the tree, the water that falls and is absorbed by trees is, is a lot of it is transpired back up into the atmosphere where it rises up and forms new clouds. And if the general motion of the atmosphere is from west to east, um, or, or from east to west in parts of the Amazon because of the latitude it's at, then that water that, that um, so it first falls, it goes into the forest. A lot of it is transpired up. It comes out of the leaves. It goes up, it, the water vapor rises and condenses and forms new clouds, which then move towards the west. And then it falls again as rain. And this pattern, this cycle is repeated six or seven times in, in parts of the Amazon. So if you cut off the source of the water on the far eastern side, then you cut off the entire cycle and the entire Amazon can go into a drought-like condition. And we've had some years of terrible droughts and they're happening more and more frequently. And in those particular years, the Amazon is actually a source of carbon. It's no longer a sink of carbon. And of course, the big, um, concern with the Amazon and any other forest is the if the regime of weather, if the weather patterns shift so that there's no longer sufficient rainfall, and if the temperatures are too high, then when those forests uh, succumb to wildfires, the new forests will not regrow where the old forests are. Instead, you often get grasslands and savanna, you know, with very few trees and much less carbon is being stored. So this is, a, this is a huge problem. Now, I happen to be traveling um, in Northern Ontario right now through the boreal forests. Um, I'm heading to Kenora, which is on the border between Ontario and, uh, and uh, Manitoba. And Ontario, you may not know, Ontario is in, has a stay at home order now and is completely shut down, but I have uh, special permission because I'm transporting my son and his friend to uh, some forest land uh, just north of Kenora, where he's going to be tree planting for, for two months. And uh, they, they plant an awful lot of trees. I mean, they plant, he's, he's going to a field camp with about 60 planters um, for two months. And uh, we just drove through a snowstorm this morning near, near uh, Cochrane, which was rather interesting. And now it's a nice and bright and sunny day because we're a bit, we're about four or five hours west of Cochrane along the Trans-Canada Highway, Highway 11. So their camp is about 60 planters and they're, they'll be at it. You have to do it a certain time of year, of course, in the spring. So they'll be at it for, for 60 days. And each, each person plants uh, many thousands of trees uh, per day. And, uh, you know, people believe it or not, you know, it's backbreaking work, of course. And, uh, you know, the trees are like yay high, you know, they're little saplings. And uh, the funding comes from forestry companies and also from the, the Ontario government. And there's some from pulp and paper companies because they have commitments to replant what, what, uh, what is cut down. So, you know, it's for, so I have a special uh, pass, which is for essential travel. So if there's any question about why I'm traveling, either on the trip there or back, which is about 20 hour drive each way, I got a compact car, which is great for gas mileage. Um, then, uh, you know, I have, this, I have the paperwork saying it's essential travel. So 
So it's uh, very, very relevant. Now, as we drive along the highway, I notice you can tell where there's been wildfires because along the sides of the road, um, you know, if there was a wildfire even four or five years ago, you know, you can easily tell that region because a lot of these fires, they sweep through the forest so quickly that they take away all the foliage and branches and the, the, the tree, the tree, uh, the base of the tree and the actual stem of the tree is still still there. I mean, it's just dead, dead wood, essentially. Um, and so you can clearly tell that. And I I've, I've sort of noticed a lot of trees, you know, haven't. Um, the buds aren't out yet. I don't know if the trees are, are dead. I mean, I've looked at some of them more closely. There's some birch trees and trees, of course, uh, bud at various times. So I'm not sure if they're dead, but there, there does seem to be a lot of uh, a lot of damage for us. But that's next to the road and they're affected also by by salt. This is fascinating, Paul. And really, I, I have to say it's, it's so inspiring. And I know that you've done so much work in, in this t climate movement, this climate fiasco that we're in and seeing that your son is carrying on the tradition and you're actually walking, what is it? Walking the walk, not talking is really, really great. I just wanna like, thank you so much for that. It's fantastic. And just a quick question. So now the trees, I'm, I'm assuming that these are like native species trees. Do you, is there anything you can share with us about them? Yeah, they're most be, mostly uh, pine, in, in the far North, the, um, it's mostly um, coniferous trees. It's mostly, uh, there's spruce and there's uh, various species of, of pine tree. And because they don't uh, shed a lot of foliage, right? Like deciduous trees, the soils are much less developed in the, in the north. So, and the soils are very, very acidic. Um, and, uh, you know, some people say, well, we'll just do more farming in the far north and it will take time for to develop soils that are less acidic and, and that are conducive to, to growing to growing uh, crops. I mean, there are some there is some farming up here. I'm not sure what type of crops um, there there are. But uh, yeah, it, it's it's really fascinating. And, and, you know, it's hard to believe uh, there, you know, there was a snowstorm. There, there was like, you know, uh, maybe half a foot of snow when we woke up in the morning from our motel and and of course uh you know it was it was a bit surprising we're almost into may so thank you so much for that so dr carter what are your thoughts on tree planting and native species and is this a practice like how is this carried out in terms of reforesting or rewilding the forests especially i mean i'm really especially interested in these arboreal forests that you had spoken to as well. Is it possible? What can be done to help them? Well, um, tree planting, of course, is, is a great relatively new development. It took us a while to learn that we could just clear the forest, that um, uh, some forests will regrow naturally, but of course, a lot of the uh, trees have to be replanted. Um, and, and it's certainly great. However, um, cutting the trees down and also replanting the trees releases a lot of carbon dioxide. So there's only one answer, and that is to stop the deforestation. It's the only answer. It has to be stopped. And um, you asked what was driving the deforestation. Well, in the case of the Amazon, we are literally eating the Amazon. Because what is driving the Amazon, at least 80%, is um, uh, cattle, the livestock meat industry, and the way that we eat. And... Um, uh, that releases um, a lot of carbon dioxide because we lose that carbon sink when we deforest the, uh, the Amazon. But also uh, when we, uh, there's this huge cattle industry, massive numbers of cattle on the planet, and uh, we, uh, we eat the meat and the cattle produce methane. And, and there's a vast amount of emissions from just the eating of meat. And uh, the good news is that certainly in North America, a lot of people are, uh, they, um, uh, I think they're doing it sort of naturally. They, they don't like to um, uh, kill animals and eat them anymore, which I think is particularly enlightened. So we have veganism on the rise. Um, I've been a vegan for some years. It took me some years to get there. But there's a lot of young people who are switching um, to the vegan diet. And I want to congratulate all, all of those people because that is very much the most effective thing you can do to uh, help the planet stop climate disruption and to contribute towards the stopping of deforestation. 
the other thing um, you, you mentioned, and Paul mentioned it as well, is the fires. And the fires in the Amazon, um, uh, we watch the fires every year from a service from NASA, which is called FIRMS, F-I-R-M-S. And the fires in the Amazon year after year are getting worse and worse. And it's truly a terrifying thing to watch. The fires are going all around the Amazon, they're going inwards, but, they're, but they are progressing from the south. And now, last two years, the fires have reached the very center of the Amazon. Uh, in, the, in Siberia, in the boreal forest, um, we have also increasing fires. And to the extent that in the Arctic, there are regions in Siberia that the new fires never go out. The people call them phantom fires there. One other thing is driving the deforestation of the Amazon. Surprise, oil and gas. There are maps that you can see which show vast reserves of oil and gas. And that's another reason why the Amazon is being cleared. Thank you, Peter, for bringing those, that, that causation up. Uh, I think it's really important. And, and it also points to the fact that there's so much that we can do on an individual level including our diets. Uh, and, and we spoke a few weeks back regarding the fishing industry. And, and I'm just gonna you know, assume that the, the, the federal subsidies or the subsidies that go to the beef and cattle industry, the subsidies that go to oil and gas, not only are they destroying our oceans, but they're destroying our forests. So unless we wanna be complicit with this um, violent, actual violence, uh, I, I do agree that a uh, vegetarian slash vegan diet is the best thing, um, the best thing for one to do. Ending these, these subsidies is, is so critically important. Thank you for bringing that up. Paul, any thoughts on this? Yes, uh, of course, uh, you know, the Amazon rainforest is often considered um, as vital for the oxygen production um, for the atmosphere. You know, it's considered the lungs of, of the planet. Um, and the uh, deforestation and the conversion of the Amazon rainforest from a carbon sink to a carbon source in these drought years is very concerning. And uh, we're heading to uh, within, you know, very short amount of time, you know, probably less than a decade where, where, or two where the the Amazon goes to a, to a complete carbon source uh, every year. So, you know, humanity thinks, uh, you know, quite linearly, and we think we have time to spare in terms of addressing the climate crisis, but there's absolutely no time to spare. And in fact, if we don't start pulling carbon out of the atmosphere um, very, very soon, then we're, we're going to lose the uh, ecosystem resources of, of trees on land to actually perform that function. A paper came out recently that was talking about business as usual, caught, resulting in a complete uh, tipping point of terrestrial plants from being a net carbon sink to a, a net carbon source. And of course, then the CO2 levels will skyrocket in the atmosphere much faster than they are doing now. Um, so, you know, we have to do a lot more than just slash uh, fossil fuel emissions. And uh, another thing that is, uh, you know, in another paper talking about terrestrial plants, there's uh, most plants are, including trees, are so-called C3 plants. And they have a peak in their photosynthesis curve. So it's maximized at 18 degrees Celsius. So when you have a lot of thermal stress on these plants, uh, higher, uh, as you go higher and higher temperatures, the plants are less able to photosynthesize. At night, they're always respiring. There's respiration going on. So what happens is, is there's less and less photosynthesis because we pass those limits and more and more respiration then those plants, this is a reason why the plants become uh, sources of carbon as opposed to sinks of carbon. Um, there's other plants that are called so-called C4 plants. They have a slightly different pathway for photosynthesis and that peaks at 28 degrees Celsius. So that's things like grasses and things like corn. 
So some of these plants, uh, you know, are a bit more resilient to the increases in temperature, but the, the efficiency at which they convert the, the uh, CO2 and the sunlight and the water into plant material and oxygen, those, those processes decrease. So crop yields decrease. Um, now, the frightening thing about the effect that humans are having on trees and plants is, I think a perfect example is the bristlecone pines, which are in the high altitudes, elevations in the Sierra Nevadas. Some of these trees um, are 5,000 years old. In fact, the oldest one I believe is called Medusa. Well, over 5,000 years old. And uh, surprisingly enough, many of these uh, trees are starting to, to die. Okay, so this is very, very concerning. I mean, they've been They've been alive for 5,000 years and here we come along, we do our, you know, we emit all kinds of greenhouse gases and we change the climate and we're killed, these trees are dying off after being alive for that length of time. So that, that's a perfect sort of canary in the coal mine for, for, for plants um, on, on, on earth, basically. Very concerning. Wow, that's very concerning indeed, Paul. And it just, you know, it just gets you right here. You know, when you think of these majestic trees that have been around for so long and just so callously we dispense with them and we create these conditions that just makes it impossible. I, I really enjoyed so much hearing from both of you today because, you know, it just continues to go back to these feedback loops and it goes to what I like to say from my Buddhist practice that, that when this happens, this happens. Nothing is an isolation. We are an interdependent web of living organisms unless we respect that, unless we can somehow come to respect life, all forms of life on this planet, we're signing, we're signing the planet's death warrant. And, and let's just hold out hope for humanity that we can turn this corner and, and, and make this right because we owe it. We owe it to coming generations, hundreds of thousands of species and the very planet itself. And so thank you for that. And, and thank you everyone for joining us here at the Climate Emergency Forum. And we have these discussions weekly. We come up with topics that we think are of great relevance. So we would like for you to subscribe, hit that bell if you wanna know what's coming up and when it's available. So stay safe, everyone. And until next time, thank you from the Climate Emergency Forum.